welcome to the Film Illogical Society, brought to you by Redacted Media and 6.5 Media. In today's episode, we look at another one of the essentials. And now, here are your hosts, Chris Scholes and T.C. DeWitt. <laughs> welcome to another episode of the Film Illogical Society, the essential show. Mm -hmm. Yes. I am one of your hosts. I'm Chris Scholes. With me grumbling over oh, there is T.C. DeWitt. I, Hello, T.C. How are I, you I, I wasn't grumbling. I, I was acknowledging with satisfaction that, yes, in fact, we exist. Yeah. Okay, we do. That's true. We do That's exist. <laughs> um, and and before we get into the show and all that, I I, I want to wish you a happy anniversary. Oh, uh, of of what? I'm trying to think of you. Of this show, of one year ago we launched our first show. Really, our first episode of of this. Well, congratulations to you, sir. Yeah, Rebel Without a Cause is the first episode that, that we did with this. So it was one year ago hey. today that it was released. All right. Well, congratulations to that as well. That's a happy, happy anniversary to you. <laughs> yeah, to both of us. So. We are Rebels right. with a Cause, and it's to discuss right. movies we think everyone should have seen at this point. <laughs> or, or at least come to that conclusion. Sure, sure. <laughs> sure. Um. So, so in the essentials show, just to kind of review, these are as TC just said, these are the the movies where we feel or we have heard, or has been ingrained in us. Like these are films that must be seen by anyone who wants to study film, understand modern film, where tropes have come from, where um, the genre setters, like the the movies the that setters. that define a genre, the movies that yeah. you can look at. A movie that comes out now and go, what was this inspired by? This is an homage to this. This is homage. That's and so these are the tracing it back to its origin. What are the movies that come up in conversation all the time that we can have full conversations about without maybe never even having seen them? <laughs> right. And and today we explore the thriller film the, ro the suspense oh thriller the, the film. romantic suspense thriller film by the master of this genre <laughs> alfred hitchcock mr or sir sir alfred hitchcock sir albert sir albert, sir hitchcock. albert hitchcock <laughs> and we are watching so this will be the first first uh post world war ii film from hitchcock 1946's notorious mm -hmm. notorious Yes, that not one. the Biggie Smalls one that came out about no. five six years ago. <laughs> yes, yes, about sixty years after this That's one. Right. That's right. Um, this film stars Cary Grant, um, the beautiful Ingrid Bergman, mm -hmm. and um, and Claude Rains. Those are like the three main characters in yeah. this, with Claude yeah. being. Yeah. Had you seen this film before? What were your thoughts going in? Did you have any thoughts going in? I had not seen this before. This is certainly one that I would be able to fake my way through a conversation because it does come up often in conversations about noir, about Hitchcock. And I knew Cary Grant was in it. I I knew Ingrid Bergman was in it. I, I didn't know much about the plot, though. I could speak mm -hmm. of, oh, this is, yes, definitely one of Hitchcock's finest, but I had never delved into exactly what this movie was about. So I didn't have too many preconceived notions going into it other than knowing it's Hitchcock, knowing it's one of his best, and 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 looking forward to to seeing exactly what this movie, if, if and how this movie would be essential to the cinematic lexicon that someone might be trying to create for themselves or we are creating for ourselves. How about you? How about yeah, you? I, I, I had not seen this before. Um, I know, I know that Cary Grant is one of the actors that had been in a number mm -hmm. of Hitchcock's biggest films. Um, I, I do, I will say that when you talk about Hitchcock, I think that, you know, Rear Window, Psycho, Birds, North by Northwest, like those are some of the bigger names. Rope. Um, Strangers on a Train. Yeah, know. like his. Strangers on a Train. I think. This one's kind of lost, but when you and I started figuring out, like, what what movie should we see? This one appeared on like Roger Ebert or somebody's like list of of Hitchcock films, mm -hmm. yeah. and it was one that neither one of us had seen before. So I think we agree that when it's a film we haven't seen, um, 
it 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 seems to uh, be a better podcast for us. At the very least, exploring it together for the first time instead of coming in with a bunch yeah. of preconceived notions. I, I, I Carrie Grant, I've watched Arsenic and Old Lace for Filmological mm-hmm. previously, and mm-hmm. uh, I've seen I've not seen the entirety of North by Northwest. I don't believe so, but. I'm a fan of his. He comes from that Jimmy Stewart, the black and white uh, era. Yeah. And he is Hollywood elite. He's very, very good. I'm, I'm, we'll obviously explore the performances and whatnot, but I don't think I could name an Ingrid Bergman movie because, like, she's not in Casablanca. She's not in, I, I mistake her for other actresses of her era. Um, she is in Casablanca. That, that is her in Casablanca. Okay. Then, yes. then I had seen her previously as well. And okay, well, I, I, don't get me wrong. I, oh, I, I'll edit all that out. <laughs> so we're good. Okay. I, I thought she might have been. I didn't look it up, so I didn't want to be wrong. And I ended up being wrong. Yeah. So I, I was familiar with these two. And I know they're royalty. I know that they're classic film royalty. And it was exciting to see these two in different roles than what I'd seen them in previously because Arsenic and Old Lace is a comedy and Casa, Casablanca yeah. was so good. I forgot she was in it. No, Casablanca <laughs> is an amazing film. I have seen that one and I do love that one, but I had not seen this. So, yeah. And, and so, um, and, and Claude Rains was also in Casablanca. I don't want you to, you know, make that mistake right. twice. <laughs> Um, but he's also known as the uh, Invisible Man in 1933's Invisible Man. I recognized him. He played the. I recognized him, but I didn't. I didn't even bother to try to figure out what I didn't recognize him from. But he was a a, a third big name, I guess. Mm-hmm. So both and both Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman had been in a number of Hitchcock films. They were two actors that Hitchcock went to often mm-hmm. for films. He actually had a. Probably uh, uncomfortable for his wife, um, adoration of Ingrid Bergman. <laughs> Directors would never find muses in in females in actresses or or actors. No. To tell you the truth, I mean, I'm sure yeah. Helen Bonham Carter was like, you know, Tim, your relationship with Johnny is getting a little weird, man. <laughs> <laughs> and then they were done. Weird. Uh, Interesting. That's cool. That's I I I understand having a, being a filmmaker myself. I understand why you want to keep working with the same people because it makes the process all the easier when crafting a story, when crafting a film, when you can just say like, "Hey, uh, remember when you did the thing that one time on that Saturday when we filmed that thing two years ago? Yeah, just do that again." Like instead of like having that fully developed relationship, I yeah. think allows actors. And directors to craft better films. I, I think too, like if you're writing and you have somebody in mind, like somebody you were mm-hmm. like, I know that this actor or this actress can do mm-hmm. this. Like they can, you know, may you may it it, it will help dictate how the story goes. Right? right. Like if you have somebody in mind and you know what they can do and what they're willing to do, probably more importantly. Um, it, it, it can be easier to kind of kind of craft and, and write those characters around mm-hmm. um, around around that actor that you want to work with. And, and these two performances, these feel like they were made for Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman, not knowing, as you've just enlightened me, that they had a relationship with Hitchcock. It makes sense that he would craft this film if with them in mind um, that he could create something so like. This didn't feel like Hitchcock in a lot of ways because I don't know what the order of his movies coming out were. I could look it up, of course, but I'm going off off the cuff here. This felt like he was taking it more seriously. I don't know if that's not fair because Hitchcock was a craftsman. He took everything seriously. But this film felt more mature for a man who's probably already in his 60s at the point, <laughs> point of making this. And – oh, no, get out of can't. Sorry. Um, uh I lost my thought because a cat ran across my computer. <laughs> uh, anyway, it, it makes it, I can feel how perfectly suited these roles in this film was for Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman. And, and uh, now yeah. I understand why. And, and, and just, yeah, I, I think the performances 
help? Because, I mean, with this type of story, you really need actors that can pull off the suspense. They can pull off. Um, they can show the tension needed to to convey that to the audience because the audience and, 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 you know, let's just like define like what makes a good suspenseful film. Um, a definition that I liked is it's when the audience knows something that the characters in the movie don't. Sure. Yeah. So suspense is built by the audience getting to the point where it's revealed to that character as well. Yeah. Well, the anticipation of when, when's it, when are they going to, when's the shoe going to drop? When are they going to find out? Yeah. When, when are they going to know? When are they going to know? The, the master of suspense, um, like Hitchcock is known as the master of suspense and, and yes. he, he crafts it so well in, in all of his movies, or at least all his suspense thrillers. And this one builds really nicely. I, I know you like to get into discussing exactly what the plot of this movie is, but there's a, a really nice foundation built in this film that, that ex, it, the foundation is laid and then he builds the tension off of that and lets it culminate really smartly, really maturely. And it, it never feels manipulative or, uh, 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 <sighs> unnecessary like he's not he's not to mm -hmm. he's not to being in i can't think of the fucking word right now <laughs> oh pardon me oops <laughs> uh no cursing sorry it's okay chad chad on our other podcast chad will drop it once in a while <laughs> um uh notorious here yeah okay so previous to this i'm trying to see what i've seen of his um of uh hitchcock hitchcock yeah like the man who knew. So I'm guessing rear window. The, well, specifically what came out before this. Oh, before yeah. I got gotcha. you. Man, he is. His library is huge. I did not realize it. Um, it is. It is. And I mean, and he passed away in just 1980. So it's not like wow. he has like, you know, he, he's he, his last films were, you know, 76 mm -hmm. was one of his last films. But um, but still, like, he he worked until the end, and he's got a huge library yeah. of films. Just like skimming it, it it feels like well, like Mr. And Mrs. Smith's on here, Young and Innocent, Sabotage, Shadow of a Doubt, Man, Lifeboat, Man Who Knew Too Much. It feels like Spellbound. Notorious is almost it, just on Hitchcock's library of essential films. This appears to be the movie that unlocked Hitchcock. Right. I mean, he's he has like over he has like two dozen plus movies before he ever got there. I mean, three dozen practically. Mm -hmm. But when I look at his most known films, it kicks off with Notorious and then Strangers on the Train, Dial M for Murder, Rear Window, Catch a Thief, The Man Who Knew Too Much, The Wrong Man, North by North, Vertigo, Psycho, like everything builds from this point on. So even just from the Hitchcock perspective. Well, I, I I posited like, oh, this feels like a more mature film than some of his more uh, twisted, uh, suspense uh, horror type movies, which he's not really mm -hmm. a horror director. Let's be honest. Uh, not, no, yeah. I mean, he, yeah, I mean, horror and suspense do travel well together. Sure, sure. I will say they're 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 very good friends. <laughs> um but uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I would say he's the master of suspense. He has some horror elements like Psycho is, uh, you know, Psycho and Birds could both be considered horror, movies, yeah. horror films just because of the element that's in mm -hmm. there. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I would agree. I don't I don't think he is a horror director, but he is somebody that modern day horror directors look sure. at. Sure. Yeah try to emulate it, so to, to go specifically to notorious which is not a horror movie at all it is definitely this no. very suspenseful there's a, a beautiful there's a sweet romance here as well like we have mm -hmm. our two main characters who carry grant and ingrid bergman that, that uh devlin devlin and uh eric and alicia. alicia yeah and that they alicia, alicia uh, that they fall for each other and then can't be together because of the circumstances of this mission that she's recruited into mm -hmm. it, it it lays down the stakes really nicely for them personally and then the suspense is built upon 
not not will they get to be together in the end, but can they get away with this this plot, this twisted scheme that they're trying to pull off? And it's it it's it hooks. It's fascinating how well this. Okay, I'm kind of like gathering my thoughts here. Movies of this era often feel like plays because it was yes. still in that transition period between stage production, the golden, like the the silver age, I suppose, classic age of cinema, which does, and we've talked about this before in, in older films, very often feels like a play being filmed. This yes. does have elements of that, but the performances being so strong and the plot being so intriguing it doesn't it wasn't boring because i could i could look at something yeah. like uh our man from havana which has a similar plot but it's dull because it does does not feel like it needs to be on the screen there's nothing being done with the camera to help build the suspense it's all in the performances and with this while yeah. the performances are strong hitchcock presents the he tells the picture he tells the story with pictures in such a fashion that the suspense yes. can be built like the slow zoom in or like the insert of the wine bottle oh why is that important like the economic use of what he shows us doesn't have that feel of movies of this ilk or this era that are very wide and just do a painting shot and let scenes play out like even even going into the 60s James Bond was still doing stuff like that where it's like oh we're just gonna let the scene play out from a wide it's like a play. People will get it. No, no. Hitchcock was like getting in people's faces and moving the camera around. Not swiftly, but enough so that it, no. it he's guiding the story visually really, really nicely in this. He knows how to build that suspense. And and one one trick, so some of the research I did, I watched the Criterion Collection for this mm -hmm. again. And uh, one thing that he, so, so a, a couple of things were going on with this film in particular. So um, producer David O. Selznick worked with Hitchcock a lot. Mm -hmm. David O. Selznick was an uh, American producer, so he kind of brought Hitchcock over from Britain, and he pushed Hitchcock to do different things, more things to use the camera more, to include romance in the thriller story. Um, and, and, and Hitchcock took a lot of that and, and got the freedom and, and used a lot of those point of view shots. Um, mm -hmm. in, in, so there's this one scene at the end, like the, the last suspenseful scene where they're, 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 it doesn't sound suspenseful, but they're walking downstairs. Yes. And by using a lot of point of view and keeping the camera paced with them with the actors as they're going down like it builds suspense because because you have like these guardians at the bottom of the steps and if things don't go right it's going to go bad for basically yes, everyone everyone on in that room there's the so uh, in discussing movies like this that especially movies that are going to be decades and decades old it's easier for us to be more have more freedom to to just speak openly and not worry about spoilers per se. Yeah. So uh, I'll just put the spoiler warning out there. If this is not a movie you've seen that you are interested in, um, please seek it out. Uh, how moving on beyond that and being able to speak more openly with Chris here, the the fact that we know that those men are Nazis without that ever being said, the fact that we yes. know that they are expatriates who are hiding in South America and that. They've already murdered a guy off camera, right? It's it's this beautiful, uh, it's that foundation. Like the information is there for the audience, for those characters, so that as we have our main cast walking down that stairs slowly of like, we just got to get out of this house and in the car and capping that off with uh, Claude Rains' character just being like, y you're not getting in this car. Good luck, pal. We're out of here and we're gone. Like that yeah. and-, and culminating the movie there even at ending it like not like a 60 seconds after that moment happens is it's not as big of a sigh of relief that you get from movies now which will build with the music da, 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 and the like yeah. which much more like the magic of cinema yep, in its yep, yep. simplest rawest form it still is a heart pumper like it still is like tense 
to see like, oh shit, how are they going to get out of this? Can they get down the stairs, out the door, in the car, drive away? Yeah. So, so just to give uh, a, a basic plot synopsis, rewind. <laughs> uh, there's 1946. There's a group of German scientists that are in Brazil. The United States thinks they might be zo- the Nazis um, trying to do something bad. So, uh, an agent finds the daughter of a convicted Nazi scientist that was just convicted in the United States. And convinces her that she can go down and she can she can help. She can uncover yeah, this. She can be their their inside man, their agent. Their, yep. And Assets. She is to, to use the spy term, the military spy term, they create an asset out of her. Yep. She she's reluctant, but she agrees to it because she doesn't see any other way. Um and um, while it wasn't the intent, uh, the main scientist down there, Claude Rains's character, he has been in love with her for most of his life. So he proposes to her and they end up getting married, mm-hmm. um, you know, which is, you know, very quickly, like after like a week of her being down yeah. there, the agent and Alicia in Greer Brigham's character, are, they are in love, but they, as TC said, but neither one can state mm-hmm. it. Um, neither because it, it would it would um, um, you know cause the it would compromise to be the mission. Done. They would compromise yep. their their the positions they've been put in. And Dev, Cary Grant's character Devlin takes this job very seriously. He's he plays everything yep. very close to the chest. Very like he's not willing to open himself up, if at all, to anyone. But he's very clearly upset. <laughs> you can see it in his eyes that this is not ideal. But the mission must come first, the country, the safety, the sanctity of America and and stopping these Nazis has to take the priority, the greater good here. And Mm -hmm. Ingrid Bergman, who has lived her life with just abandonment, her father was a traitor. He's gone, kills himself in jail. Uh, She's she has no one. And so when this guy comes along who charms her and is sweet to her and like he shows up at a party uninvited to recruit her. Yeah. He's just there yeah. and she just kind of falls for him there. She does drink. That's like her vice. Mm-hmm. And that's something that, uh, Devlin uses to his advantage. He brings it up to make her feel guilty about her drinking, yeah. you know? And, and, um, there's a question. There is a question of whether or not he is just using her and, Okay, so I l- let's fast forward a little bit. I, I, I often will yeah. take take the films we're watching to reference other things we've seen in the future. I think of something like The Thomas Crown Affair, which has been made twice. I'm sp- speaking mm-hmm. of more modern era with the Pierce Brosnan, uh, Thomas Crown Affair, or something like The Tourist with uh, Angelina Jolie and Johnny Depp. But it's that it's there's a romance here. There's love. Or is it? The woman typically is the, the, char- the POV character that's asking – wait, is he just using me for the mission or does he actually love me? And from yeah. character to character, just speaking of, of Devlin and Alicia, the tension and suspense of their relationship is that question, is that is the question of does Devlin love her? And yes, he does. You can see it when he looks at her. But because mm-hmm. she questions it, because he transfers at one point, like I'm done with this mission. I'm on to the next one. There's something more exciting in Spain. Uh, so says his boss. You have that doubt. So something like Thomas Crown Affair, where Rene Russo's characters question whether or not Pierce Brosnan has been using her the whole time, or if he does in fact love her. It's it makes for good suspense in just a relationship, because you you kind of you're rooting for her. She's she's innocent here. Her dad was the Nazi. She's not the Nazi. She's trying to do the right thing for these agents, for the government. She's she's making all these very altruistic sacrifices for like recompense for not even her sins. No, no. And. Yeah. And so um, just to kind of so so part of the reason that Devlin transfers is because. She did get married to Claude Rains's character to keep the charade that 
the charade <laughs> of that she was a Nazi. And and it was very hard for him, but he can't admit it, but he is seeing it out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So she notices that there's a, a wine bottle that is very seems to be very sensitive. So they have a party. Uh, Devlin gets there. She she gets a special key and we'll talk about that key scene because that was pretty mm-hmm. awesome. Um, um, to get into this lock. Why, yeah. Why, why is that, this the wine only room bottle? She can't why get. is this wine bottle? It affects one of Claude Rains' guests. Like, why yes. was he so and, upset about this? And it turns out that they're storing plutonium in it, basically, or spent plutonium. Mm-hmm. And that is what the U S government needs. They need that evidence. Yes. So Devlin sees it. Um, they, he, a bottle drops and breaks. They try to cover it up. Um, they both get out of there before, um, Claude Rains's character gets there to see it. And, um, he figures out that he married an agent. Mm-hmm. She is an agent. And he confides in his mom who says, well, we can't let, the rest of the group know because they'll kill they you. They will kill you if they find out. So we must take care of it of ourselves. We'll take, and so they slowly start poisoning Alicia. Yeah. And that's when uh, Devlin starts noticing that she's not feeling well, and he thinks it might be hangover at first, but then he figures out, oh no, there's something more going on. Yeah, she, you know, she's just slipping back into the drink. She is a lush, you know. And so, uh, yeah, so that's, he goes to the house, he rescues her. And, and, and out. Alexander, so, uh, Claude Rain's character, Alexander is, he, him and his mom figure it out and he's, he feels betrayed. She convinces him yep. like, you need to kill your wife. <laughs> uh, just do it slowly yep. to make it look like an accident. And, and uh, nearly gets away with it. If, if Devlin hadn't showed up to. To rescue, to say goodbye, essentially, to... Yeah, because yeah, cause she was basically incapacitated. She couldn't really stand on her mm-hmm, own anymore. Mm-hmm. She couldn't... Um, she could barely sit up in bed anymore because of the poison that was slowly killing mm-hmm. her. So, ba- yeah, Devlin basically carried her down the steps as as uh, yeah. Claude Rains was yeah, like... Alexander's like, what are you, what are you doing? doing? You can't take her... What? Okay, take me with you. Okay, just let's just get it out of this house before my Nazi friends kill me. God, that to go back to that stair shot because the whole movie culminates with that descending that staircase moment, and there's yeah. so much at play of what what makes that work. It's not just the camera movement, but the camera placement as well. Like we're in with them as they're whispering yes. to each other, but then every time we look down at the men, we see it from this wide of like them looming yes. below this these four men who are like. We know these guys are evil. They, they already killed one of these guys. They're going to kill him too. Yep. And I love this, this, the, it's, we don't see a gun. We don't see blood. We don't see any murders. It's all built within the narrative, within the dialogue, within what we don't see. Because there's so much of what, what helps suspense and tension in what we're directly shown and what we're not shown. Mm-hmm. And it's, mm-hmm. it's this incredible we, we aren't shown close-ups of these men at this point. They are a force no. at the bottom of the stairs versus when we meet them at the dinner at the beginning of the movie, which we get looks at them. We get them talking. They're chatting. They are evil. Yeah. Who knows this? <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, I love, I love, yeah, well, I mean, we, you've, you've painted out the story in, in broad strokes at least, but. Uh, yeah, and, and so why don't we, I think this is a good time oh, for us to oh, take sure, a break. Oh, sure, 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 yeah. Why don't we take a break and then when we come back, we can talk about some of the shots that we liked and we can we can say if this film is essential sure, or not. Sure. Let's say let's do that. Let's figure out what the product is for today. <laughs> hey, this is TC. And this is Jim from the Studio Demands It podcast. Where every episode we take a demand from a hypothetical studio. Which could be you. And challenge ourselves to conceptualize pitch and craft a film based on the stipulations or the demands we are given we talk about movies all the time particularly we complain about the choices made in the films we've seen we're nerds like that and of course like any good nerd does we automatically assume that we could do better even with the demands and restrictions that clearly must have been put on by a production so head on over to studiodemandsit.com and listen to our previous library of episodes 
a library of previous episodes. Our precious library, Jim. <laughs> Our library of precious episodes. <laughs> You're a pirate Smeagol. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So head on over to studiodemandsit.com to listen to our library of episodes. And submit your demand for a future episode, too. So go do that. Okay, bye. Okay, end of ad. Psst, hey, you. Come over here. Uh, who, me? Yeah, you. Okay. Hey, do you like Zelda? Yeah, I like Zelda. Who oh, doesn't? Oh, yeah? You like video games? Yeah, I dabble. I play them, yeah. Yeah. Do you like listening to people talk about video games? Of course I like listening to people. Who reads anymore? Well, 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 buddy, do I got a podcast for you. It's called Fan Fiction, you know, with an X. Oh. And you can find it on all your major podcast distributors. That sounds amazing. Oh, buddy, you have no idea. One question, though. Why are you in my room? Are you a scientist with experience in working with plutonium? Well, the normal, not bad, but good German company in Brazil, founded in 1946, is looking for you. Pay benefits galore, just no questions. <laughs> or acting. Oh yeah, don't, don't 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 be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. <laughs> Use hash code film ill. To get a free bottle of wine. Ooh. Now that's an offer you did not see coming <laughs> just for you. So that's, thank you thank to that, that sponsor. sponsor. The, not, yeah. the not bad, the normal not bad, but good German yeah. company. Totally, total, yeah. totally good and not bad German company. That's what, yeah. I'm recruiting bad. today. I, it's interesting. Like not, I, I did not see that coming. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> So, so let's, so there's a couple of shots I want to talk about. We've talked a lot about the stairs and we'll get back to that, but there is a shot. Um, there's a couple. So, so one thing that Hitchcock would do is, is he was famous for, um, perspe- shots in perspective. Mm-hmm. Okay. And there's, so there's this one where it's, mm-hmm. it's, um, they're in the process of poisoning Alicia and normally they do it with their coffee. Mm-hmm. And so there's a shot of her sitting in the seat and there's like a coffee table right next to it or a side table with the with the cu- cup on it. And the cup is in the foreground of the picture, perfectly focused and all that. I mean, it, it's a famous shot because the, the cup is it, it, it's like you are like the cup is like right in front of the camera and looks so huge. And there, there's Alicia. Um, and it, it's because it was it was a, a, a he had a large cup. Mm hmm. Like oh, an oversized coffee the prop, cup. A prop cup that was to prop, yeah, all right. prop cup to put right in front of the camera to give that perspective. Um, which was which was um um the other another famous shot is start of the third act, I think, where um Alicia finally has the key, mm-hmm. the Unica key. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. And yeah. she's at the dinner party. And she has it in her hand. And so this starts out on top of the balcony. So connected to the stairwell. And it's a it's a shot that slowly tracks in and becomes a close up of her hand. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and you see the key in there. Unica. Boom. So that shot. All right. So 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 um, uh, put your director hat on, which I know you often I, I keep it nearby. I mean, it's always, it's always. Even when you're not a director, right. you wear it and you tell people what I can't to do. Help it. <laughs> um, so that shot, it was done in four takes. Okay. Which each, each take the camera moved a little closer each time. And then, so basically like, like some people like had to like kind of sit in a certain position. Oh. Uh, stills of each camera setup were taken um, so that they could get and watch and see things. And, um, and, and so, yeah, they had to set it up four times mm-hmm. and do a zoom in four different times and then put it all Stitch together it all and together. make it one wow. smooth shot. It's extremely smooth shot. That is incredible. And it's, it, it, it's, it's like, that's how you open a, a scene. Mm-hmm. Like that's how you. 
because it, it tells you there's a big party going on here. There's lots of people. And then you zoom in right to her hand and you see, oh, she's hiding something. She's got the key because you never saw her go in and take right. the key. She 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 saw it. And um, she knew where it was, but but yeah, all those little things. It's like it tells you, like, oh, she did the, this. And the economy of that. It's funny that sort of shot would be so easily created today. But going back yeah, to the with the digital right, zooms, going and, to the and all that, going but, to the '40s and creating a shot like that. That is that's some Citizen Kane level camera work right there. Where it's like, wow, at the time, how the hell did they do that? Uh, we we can yeah. understand how they did it now, but also the economy of that key, the economy of storytelling of that key where it is the only key with big words on it, Unica. It is the yes. only round key, right? <laughs> we yeah. see the lock on the door, Unica, right? It's this very economical way to visually tell us, all, give us all the information we need to understand what we're seeing. It's great. And and the, the handoff of that key, the, the getting it back to the key ring, right? Because... Uh, yep. Alexander takes his keychain out. He can tell something's wrong. He sets it down, and looks at it, and he's like, ah, it doesn't say anything. But we can clearly see he knows his key's gone. And then waking up in the morning to go look at it again and go, oh, and now it's there. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Something's wacky here. <laughs> to then move himself downstairs to discover the the dirt on the floor. Like, yeah, it's yeah, just it's like good. sees his little clues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, it's like we know what happened and we're seeing these characters Figure learn. It out. It's like, yeah. oh, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And he doesn't go after Devlin. He goes after Alicia. Right, because Devlin being the, the master he is, and this is this is really clever, he's uh, he's made it seem and appear to, to Alexander that Devlin's just in love with her. He's Not that he could yes. possibly be. He's just some dude who keeps nosing around on his, on his now wife, on Alexander's wife. And... Yeah. The, and Devlin was sharp enough and quick enough in the moment to like kiss me, kiss me. No, well, no, he'll he'll yep. think I want him to think that. Kiss me, and now push me away. Like he's he's a master spy without being cheeky one liner James Bond. Like cool. He's just it's a very realistic, I, what I suppose is realistic spycraft. It's like the simplest way. It's mm -hmm. like don't. It, this doesn't have to be kung fu fighting and gadgetry it's 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 deception it is spycraft it's great and and alexander falls for it he doesn't think twice that it could possibly be devlin would be the spy he only thinks that alicia is the spy alicia yeah. yep yep now did did you now one thing that hitchcock was famous for was he cameoed oh yeah in every one of where his films. was he i did i don't so, know where he is in this well, yeah, so the, there's the, the you know, like he had some ones where he's just sitting on a train or whatever or just shows sure, up sure. as a, a gawker looking. Um, the famous one from Lifeboat, which is a movie where there's like three or four guys in a lifeboat floating on the ocean. The entire film, he is cameos. He's on an advertisement on a newspaper. Nice. Like for, for a big and tall <laughs> Um, men's clothing. He was a very tall man. So, he was a very tall man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so in this one, he is in that party scene. Um, and probably in the middle of the party, there's a shot of like a, a, a punch bowl table. And he just kind of comes in, gets himself a glass and then walks Perfect. up. Perfect. There he is. That's so fun. So it's very quick. It's it's but he's in it. He He, he has that cameo. Um, it, it was something where he, you know, where where people would go to his films just to see where, where he came. Well, I mean, in in many regards, he created the cameo, right? That that yeah. he's he's often credited with not just with two things: the cameo and the MacGuffin, like to for coining the term MacGuffin and for essentially creating the celebrity cameo. Uh, and yeah, I, I had forgotten to, to keep an eye out for him. It's very much a where's Waldo or where's Wally for our international listeners of, of where yes. is he in this movie? Um, a, a couple other tropes that are more specific to Alfred Hitchcock, but I believe I, I do feel that some of these things have um, gotten more into the zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. One is 
Um, you have a male character who has an extremely close relationship with their mother. Yeah. <laughs> so in this one is Alexander. He is the only person he can pretty much trust and confides in. Um, she she is the one who told him, do not marry her. Mm-hmm. She's no good. She's the brains of this apparition. Um, Did Hitchcock have a relationship yeah. with his mom that was similar to this? Because uh, there's um, shades of psycho in this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they, they yeah, they work together to kill somebody then. Mm-hmm. And um, um, another is is uh, assumed identity. So people that that take on different identities and people assume it's one way when it's not. And that would be Alicia's character, Alicia's character being a Nazi. She's not a Nazi. Mm-hmm. And then um, again, we talked about before Ingrid Bergman, Cary Grant were in a number of Hitchcock films. Um, Ingrid Bergman, especially again, I said, um, he had a huge crush on her. So it it would be hard not to. She's a very, just seeing her on screen. She's a very lovely woman. She is. Yeah. And, and, and and a very, very good. She, she, she reminded me, I don't know if you've seen Casablanca, but the woman in that, she's so, so lovely. I don't know if you've, if, uh, I can't remember who, who (laughs) played. Ilsa Faust. Oh, (laughs) Um, so one, um, we talked about this scene already, but I just want to talk about a little bit more. So, so, um, the ending, the, the, the last suspenseful film, part of the film where they're coming, descending the staircase. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I, I watched a video essay about this scene and, and there's so many things that it's set up to be. So, um, like the, there are certain things that, that helped establish this. So first of all, the very opening scene of the film and the opening scene of, or the opening shot of this scene um, is focused on a door Mm. as a door being like an opinion. So in the opening of the film, there's a closed door in a, in a, in a court of law where Alicia's dad, it opens up and he's being sentenced to life in prison for being a Mm -hmm. spy. In this scene is Devlin, pulling up his car to this mansion and coming up to this imposing Mm -hmm. door. And, and it's a matter of, so in the opening, like the, the character you're following doesn't get into the door. They open it and then everyone comes out because the, the ruling is done in this one, Devlin, the door opens and he's got to get his way in. That's a good, good juxtaposition. That's incredible. I had not. So it's, process that at all i i wouldn't have mm-hmm. either but it was in this video essay so I'm just <laughs> take it. the credit man <laughs> um so then um then other other elements so so uh hitchcock makes it very deliberate that you see um uh, devlin go up the stairs mm-hmm. takes him about nine seconds to get up the stairs so you see him him going up and and again he takes time to show the entire thing i mean a lot of directors they may show him going towards the stairs and then cut to a shot of him coming up the stairs and going around the corner hitchcock makes sure that you see every single stair that he climbs and then it takes nine seconds Mm -hmm. because when they come in when they're coming down the stairs now it is i believe it was 75 percent longer or something like that like something ridiculous longer yeah yeah you know, like it takes nine seconds to go up and down these stairs. It's going to take, it take a minute and a half to come down. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it just it just builds. So as a viewer, you subconsciously you see, oh, that, it's the stairs. It doesn't take long to go mm-hmm. up. So now that the camera is following you and you're going down each stair slowly because he's carrying Alicia or Alicia's putting all of her weight on Devlin leaning Mm -hmm. into him and holding on to him, barely walking down the stairs. You have Alexander who's trying to convince him like, like, you know, what are you going to leave? Take me with you. Yeah. He's practically clinging onto his arm on the other side. And and he's like, not sure what to say because his mom is behind him saying, you have to say something, Mm -hmm. Alex, you have to tell them something. You have to reassure them so they don't get suspicious. Kill all of us, unless you do yeah. something, man. And and he he freezes until the very end when he says, "Oh, De- Devlin came and he's going to bring her to the hospital." They, you know, we they called ahead, so it's mm-hmm. all set. Um, which turns out to be the line that gets him killed. Yeah. But um, um, 
yeah, just that. And then the last shot of that scene then of this there is the door closed behind Alexander. So that imposing door, him going in it slowly with his three Nazi friends just standing there waiting for him. And the door closes. It, yeah. And that's 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 the end of the yeah. film. The it's it's awesome. It's such awesome suspense, tension building. And it's even you mentioning like, oh, the movie starts with this door. Like it's we we know we have all the information and so do the characters at this point. And it's this yeah. great culmination of a film. And and while while another movie might give us more, show us them driving to the hospital, get one last conversation between Alicia and Devlin. Uh, I, I movies that have sure. come since this yeah. certainly have built upon this. I mentioned Thomas Crown Affair, which is a suspense romance. It's a lot of tension. It's a mm-hmm. lot of spy craft. There's a lot of cheeky fun to be had because this genre has moved more towards the romantic fun that can come out of this. But there are still films like this that deal solely in suspense. Uh, the Contractor came mm-hmm. out recently that was, uh, uh, no, I'm thinking of a Chris, the wrong Chris Pine movie. But there are movies that still play in this m- mystery, this suspense, this tension, but also having the romance in there. Uh, Deep Water isn't a spy movie, but it's it's a movie that you're questioning the motives of your two romantic leads. Do they love each other? Do they want to murder each other? And while a modern movie would would indulge, which is the word I was trying to find earlier for what Hitchcock is, doesn't do, indulge in so much of the movie's uh, uh, the faces and the risk and the looks and the the economy at which this is told mm-hmm. is is incredible, and and I I was so impressed by how when the movie came to an end, the satisfaction of the story it it culminated appropriately and satisfactorily where I thought, wow, that was really, really cool. I, I, I cared about these characters. I, and all these subconscious tricks to give me all the information I need as an audience, as a viewer to understand what the hell is at stake here. It's not just getting away with it, but it's the why and the how and the what if, and it culminates in spectacularly in that, in that finale. Which and it would not, it would not feel as suspenseful and tense and tense without the ground, the, every brick that was laid up to that point, and I, and oh, and yeah. not just sorry, I, that's not just the stairs, but even going to the wine cellar when when Alexander discovers yeah. the broken bottle and he goes and he looks at the labels of the bottles and sees they've replaced the broken one with the wrong year and and that was a mistake. Well, even. Even before that, you have so you have the party and you have all those wine out and you oh, have and the butler built, yeah. opening these bottles of wine. And so you see it starts out with like 20 bottles in there. The next time it's 10 mm-hmm. bottles. The next time it's three bottles. And Devlin's so and cool. And down it. in the wine yeah, cellar. And Devlin is so cool yeah. about it. Like he's so calm and cool. He's just like, we just have to hope they don't run out of wine. And Alicia didn't even consider that. She's like, what do you mean? Well, if it runs out of wine, they will have to go down to the wine cellar. Oh, oh, yeah, God. And he's like, more. it's fine. He never loses his cool. He's yep. he's very, very level and very calm through this through the whole this dangerous thing, which makes him that much better of a spy. It, it's really interesting to yeah. look specifically at Devlin as a character as a spy, and compare him to mm-hmm. other famous spies, right? James Bond, Ethan mm-hmm. Hunt, Jason Bourne of the modern spy era, who are always. Uh, Either too cool or or too on the back foot. Devlin is like Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy over here. He's like Smiley. He's he is laser focused and professional and calm through the whole thing. So and, and speaking of Ethan Hunt, um, in many ways it's been written that Mission Impossible Two was a virtual remake. Oh my of God, this you film. are right. Holy shit, I did not consider that at all, but you are correct. I mean, it's John Woo doing his American uh, cinematic action nonsense. Yeah. And it's definitely the weakest of the Mission Impossible franchise, but you are right. 
I didn't even think about that until just now. That's, that's hilarious. And, and, you know, and maybe it's one of those things where it's like, maybe that film is stronger than, because, because I, I, I think the, the modern day, because that, you know, I, I think the Mission Impossible movies are more action thrillers. Mm-hmm. They're not suspense. Not not necessarily. No, not really. Not necessarily. Not really. There's some elements of suspense in there, but it, they're not like Notorious is a suspense. Right. Film. First and foremost. There, yep. there, there's no, you know, the, you, you don't see much action. You don't see the one Nazi get killed by the other right. Nazis. You don't see what happens to Alexander. Mm-hmm. You, you don't see any. You don't even see the, the dad kill himself. You just hear about mm-hmm. it. There's no violence that you see at all in this film. It's a very clean film um so so you know it's it's not an action film it's a suspense it's a thriller um where you know so i I think like using this as a as a kind of that baseline and making an action i I think that's why it doesn't work because you're kind of mixing genres and you lose um the element that i think what makes this film great the the other thing about this film that is different from, I think, modern suspense or modern thrillers. And you, you hit on it before, but it ends with Alexander just going into the door and the door yeah. closing. Like it, 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 and again, you had said this before, but any, any modern day film, they're going to have epilogues mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. of showing them, you know, like uh, Alicia in the hospital and them holding hands or something like that yeah. because she's going to live or, you know, or you're going to have something what happens with Alexander, but, you know, do the Nazis yeah, kill him? But it's um, it's tr- or, or the the police raiding the mansion or something right. at that. But point. it's trusting the audience like Hitchcock trusted the yeah. audience. They We have all the information we need to know what's going to happen from here, or at least to make really, but, really appropriate sus, uh, uh, assumptions. Yeah, but but I think, too, just the emotional gratification mm-hmm that we end the movie in like it feels so much better at that point like that emotionally where you know the audience is most satisfied right at that yeah. moment it's like go go it's and that's it's where the he, prestige that's where he that's ends the it. Ma- that's magic where, of cinema right there no window when to yeah. leave <laughs> close the curtain we got it lights yep. off <laughs> yeah and so i think that's where a lot of modern films kind of lose it is that they have to fe- they feel they have to tell the rest of the story mm-hmm. And it's like you're just you're losing that emotional win for the audience. Yeah, that. Yeah, I. I, It's not the it's not not the same thing at all in terms of content or or premise or whatnot, but in the control of tension and and ending a film with the exhale to guy oh. We yeah. did it and not, and just like cool, movie's done. We got the, you got the top, the, the best response you could possibly get. End the movie now. I think of something like Whiplash, which is a movie of tension. It's the drumming movie yeah. with Miles Teller and J.K. Simmons, uh, Damien Chazelle, uh, director. Um, that movie ends in a similar fashion where it's like, as soon as the audience can exhale, get, get out, we're done. And that is a control in suspense stories storytelling the 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 control at which someone needs to have to be able to pull that off is masterclass and to and to discuss the essential quality of something like this to look at hitchcock yes watch strangers on a train check out psycho even even watch the birds for as silly as it is there's a number of hitchcock movies you can watch but to specifically look at this one and to look at that control of the camera of the I, I always use this, the economy of the storytelling, the the way the mm-hmm. tension is built and released over the course of this film. That is what made this movie worth watching. And this is a movie I would I would definitely point to to say, look, you don't got to get flashy. You can trust the audience mm-hmm. and you can trust the story and you can trust the performances that you don't need to see a body floating in the river to know what happened to that little scientist with the mustache. You don't need to see what happens. Right. To Al- right. Yeah. You don't need to see what happens to Alexander after the fact, because you got all the information you need. That dude's screwed. <laughs> He's those guys are going to, if the, 
if the American government isn't able to swoop in and take care of them before they can get the hell out of there, at the very least, Alexander and probably his mom are not long for this world. And yeah, it's yeah. This this was a really really cool watch because knowing it by title, knowing it was Hitchcock, I assumed, hey, yeah, that, this is going to be great. I didn't under, I didn't quite comprehend until I had watched it why this movie is held in the regard it is. Because there are thousands of movies that have come since that play with tension and suspense and romance all at the same time. And I'd, I'd be hard pressed to find something, even just thinking off the top of my head, that came before this that did, it, did anything better than this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, he's known as the master of suspense for a reason, mm-hmm. right? Like he is like when and. And um, let's kind of um, get into it. Like I, I, there are a small handful of directors that can be called iconic. Mm-hmm. That most, if not all, of their library could be considered iconic. And I think Hitchcock is one of those few directors that you could pick up almost any of his films. Mm-hmm. And find something iconic and essential in that film. Even not just his films, but even his show, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, which always yes. terrified me as a little kid watching it. Like it was the last show on Nick at Night on the weekdays, and I was like, I can't yes. watch this. I'm too scared. Grandma turned it off. Uh, the <laughs> the the when thinking of the great directors, right? I understand Hitchcock uh, had his vices, and there's been biopics out since that talk about some of his lewd behavior. But when thinking of other master directors like like Kubrick, Kubrick's a scary man. Just looking at him, he's scary. The yeah. movies he creates, yeah. the control at which he created them at is frightening. And they're so good. Like they're frightening and masterclass filmmaking. But there's that element of being afraid of the guy. I can be impressed by the guy, but I'm afraid of the guy. I understand Hitchcock was a man of control and 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 his, you know, uh, the sins he may have had. Uh, he doesn't yeah. strike me as a scary man. He strikes me as this very no, intriguing I, filmmaker. And he crafts films likened to his personality that are very enigmatic and mysterious and interesting and hard not to engage I, with. I think it says something when you have your stable of actors that, and and not just your you know, the, the chorus type actors, but you have main headline stars that keep wanting to work with mm-hmm. you, you know, that, that continue on. And, and, and he had all, I mean, Jimmy Stewart was in a number of his films. Cary Grant was in a number of his films. Ingram Bergman was in a number of his films. These are all big actors at the time, like the big names. And they continuously, be, I mean, I think the equivalent would be like a Scorsese. Sure. Sure. Today, oh, and De Niro, where you have the DiCaprio, De Niro, and then yeah, so you have the big names that want to be in his films and continually to make mm-hmm. them. Um, but I and I think another difference between what Hitchcock did and like a, a Kubrick is how much more prolific Hitchcock was. Like he made films, um you know, almost every year he had at least one film coming out for a, a good part there. Um, and he hit his cinematic, like, like stride, like you said, right after this mm-hmm. film, like in the fifties, well, it, you know, starting with notorious, um, he's got a film in 47, 48, 49, 50, 51. And he's got 53, yeah, you're not two kidding. and 54, two and 55, two and 56, 57, 58, 59. And then two in 1960. Wow. His Alfred Hitchcock Presents show was, was also on from 1955 <laughs> to, to 1961. Yeah, he he 70 director credits to his name over the course of several decades. That desire to tell film and to craft such good film. This isn't someone who is mcdonald's seen this. I'm using that as an adjective. <laughs> he wasn't like pumping this out for the sake of pumping them out. There's craftsmanship and everything he did, and this is clearly a yeah. man who loved to do this. To 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 he was so to to create stuff so thoughtful and calculated, and 
weirdly to not, he doesn't feel like someone who I'd be afraid to engage with. I use Kubrick as the example because Kubrick wasn't a contemporary of Hitchcock, more of an inheritor of his style of controlled yes. filmmaking. Uh, someone like Tarantino, uh, Spielberg certainly is the true successor to Hitchcock in a lot of ways uh, in terms of uh, mm -hmm. like the control of film and, and, and cinema as a... Um, and kind of establishing, like like Spielberg has done so much for filmmaking in general. Sure, sure. How yeah. he sees things. And the fact, I think that both of them, like they do tackle, they, it's like Scorsese, someone like Scorsese kind of has one lane mm -hmm. that he focuses on, which is usually New York City. <laughs> Gangsters. Mafia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that, that, I mean, he's, he's diverged a little bit off that, but that's like his main focus. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I think you have Spielberg and Hitchcock. They, they're they kind of all over the place. I mean, I don't think anyone's going to look at Hitchcock and go, oh, this guy is a, makes brilliant comedy. No, <laughs> but there's a lot of funny parts in his films. Like he uh, again, whether it's it's him being the funny one, like his, his cameo mm -hmm. and what he does. Or, or just some of like the the the, the human nature stuff. Yeah, that, that it's and that goes to tension as well. That goes to you can break yes. tension with a breath of relief or a laugh, and and that goes to the control at which he has to to look at Spielberg as an inheritor of Spiel, of Hitchcock. It's easy to write off Spielberg as this showboaty blockbuster director, but go look at Jaws. Look at Close Encounters. The, the early uh, Spielberg stuff, there's the, the tension. It goes to suspense. It goes to crafting mm -hmm. a moment that leads you to hold your breath and then exhale. He learned from the best. You watch Spielberg's early stuff, you can see shades of inspiration toward to, to, uh, from Hitchcock. Mm -hmm. So the essential quality of Hitchcock is indisputable. No one's going to deny that he's he's one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. To watch something like Notorious here, I, I, I if you don't mind me saying, I think the, to get my thoughts on the essential quality of this, I think this is an essential watch specifically for tension. For uh, I'll use the term one last time, and you can take a shot re-listening to this every time I say it, the economy in which he details his story. The characters' motivations, their relationships, the development of the plot through very careful and calculated camera work and the scripts themselves. If you are trying to tell suspenseful stories, this is the guy to watch. And a movie like this is a great point of inspiration for showing how simply you can tell a story that still has the, the resonance and the impact you want from a story like this. So I say, I say, yes, this is, to, this is a great piece of essential filmmaking. Uh, I, to, to make a descent down the stairs as suspenseful as that was, yeah. you know, like, like, um, you know, like how many directors or screenwriters would be like, you know, have them not go that route, not go directly at it but maybe try to climb out the window right <laughs> run try for to, it uh, you know, no you go i'll stay behind i'll distract them yeah like like so much of that would but it's like i mean i think that goes to devlin's character like he's just gonna be cool and calm and just go right at it because he knows he's got the level and it's like brilliant just you build all that up and and just going down stairs is suspenseful yeah I mean, I, 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 I think it'd be hard to establish that if you're another director that you're going to do something like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think the the one movie, and I don't know if you've seen this one or not, it's a silent film out of Russia called The Battleship Potemkin. Mm -hmm. um, it is one of the films, and, and maybe we'll watch it sometime. It's this old silent film, um, but it's famous for the stairwell. Um, Brian De Palma rips it off in Untouchables. <laughs> um uh, um, but um, it, it's famous for like a, a stairway and, and building suspense on this large outdoor stairway of, of all these people mm -hmm. running 
and just, you know, who's going to get crushed? Who's going to get killed? Who's going to get shot by the soldiers that are coming oh. behind them? Um, and and um, so, there, yeah, there's lots of elements there, but it's like, it's, yeah. So I I would agree. I, I think coming into it, I, I was going to say that um, Notorious isn't necessarily an essential film, but Hitchcock is an essential director. Yes, yes. I have no argument there. Um, I, and I, I think both are. So I think I think Notorious can be a an essential film, um, but I think more importantly, I think it's it's Hitchcock. You need to watch mm-hmm. Hitchcock. You need to watch some of his big films. And again, not necessarily Birds. Not you know, Psycho is in the zeitgeist. You've seen Psycho, even if you haven't mm-hmm, seen mm-hmm. it. But to watch, yeah, uh, this film to watch Lifeboat, Shadow of a Doubt. Um, Spellbound, Vertigo, Bound, Rear Window, uh, Vertigo, Strangers on a Train, Dial M for Murder, To Catch a Thief, The Man Who Knew Too Much, like North by Northwest. Like these are all films that are just expertly done. And, and he's a man who, um, who did inspire generations of filmmaking. North by Northwest alone yes. is responsible for From Russia with Love. If you want to see what yeah. James Bond like Hitchcock wanted to do a James Bond. Like that was one of his dream things he never got to accomplish because the Broccoli's didn't like Hitchcock, but they ripped him off because there's even there's recreations of Hitchcock in the sh- the early the three Connery, the original Connery trilogy of Bond movies are tapped in to what Hitchcock was doing. What well, yeah, and I, I think what makes Hitchcock so essential as well as again the, how prolific he was and how accessible he was because with his show he put him his method his thoughts it, you, you, as an audience as 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 a aspiring filmmakers you got to see him all the time like what other famous filmmakers had a weekly show or a uh, uh, um, uh, yearly show or whatever well, they, that they would make yeah. themselves, open themselves up to He's that. Creating a, he created um, a brand. He created a brand like Walt Disney yeah. or. Uh, um, yeah, his his yeah. outline of the, the round head and round belly. Yeah. Uh, Our famous son in that song. Walt Disney and Tyler Perry come to mind as creators who who they are mm-hmm. the brand, right? You, you, you know, Tyler, you see Tyler Perry, you know what you're going to get Walt Disney in his Walt Disney presents. Like he would open up the the movie every week. Hitchcock was a brand. He, he created this image of this is what you can expect this. I'm going to give you these type of stories week by week. Now come see my movies and get that on a bigger scale. It's very fascinating because there's not a lot of filmmakers who have done that. I can I can name a right. handful like I can name a handful where like, you know, exactly what we're going to get because who they are as people and how they present themselves yeah. as auteurs. Chris Nolan, uh, Quentin Tarantino, uh, Spike Lee, those are directors who their movies represent are represented by them. Like You see them in interviews. They give you what who they are and their films are reflective of that. And Hitchcock was this cheeky weirdo <laughs> like he knew how to like be weird and yeah be, be sh- like just strange like like his he, he was never so pompous or uh elitist that he he took himself so seriously he was willing to to weirdly goof off in his very dry dry way uh, not that notorious is this laugh out loud film by any means but no uh, it's all about tension. Tension is uh, the release of tension. It can be in a laugh as well as a sigh, as I said before. So, so yeah. So yeah. So I think we are in agreement with that. Yeah. So any final thoughts that you want to share? I think you said it well that Hitchcock himself is the essential. And we, we're not, we're, we didn't have to tell you that. If you're listening to this show, you already no. knew that. But what, what our series here is doing is, is we can have conversations about, famous films and famous filmmakers without ever having seen any of their movies. What we're saying here is it's worth seeing these movies. And this is a great example. Yeah. of that. Yeah. And by no means I, is, is Hitchcock overrated or um, I, I know he's very much talked about in the film world and, um, but it's not like a pretentious mm-hmm. pompous type thing. Like he, he was just, 
good. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he knew he had figured out what he what he needed to do and um, to to tell great stories mm-hmm. that that you know again i mean it was made in 1946 and he still felt that tension he still felt like oh what's gonna happen are they gonna get out <laughs> they're, not, they're not gonna get out they're gonna be putting wine bottles oh no they're gonna have to so okay all right well thank you everybody for listening um i i think there's a poll for us to go uh, into the 1970s, maybe, which is not an area we typically go in for the essential show because a, a lot has been um, uh, already you know, established. A, a, yeah. a lot of, yeah, but um, but we're looking at at a couple in the 70s, so we, we might stop there next. So uh, <laughs> we'll we'll let you know soon what our next yeah, film. Keep is. an eye out on the socials. That's where we'll drop the knowledge. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, Yes, and if you have an essential film or a film you feel is essential, let us yeah, know. Give, give us, drop us a line, and however, uh, if you want to hit me on Twitter, TC's Big Head at, T, uh, at TC's Big Head. Hit me up if you want to converse there. I know shulzy has got Twitter as well, or yeah, yeah, or find Filmological on all the socials as well. Find Filmological on, on the Facebook, on the Twitter, or you can even go to Six Five Media and drop it there if you want. So yeah, yeah. cool. All well, thanks, right, thanks well, for thank you, chatting, everybody. Chris. This yeah. has been our show. Yep. Yeah, this has you, been a show. <laughs> it has been a show. Thank you again for listening to the Film Illogical Society. If you'd like to listen to similar podcasts, please check out 65 Media on Stitcher, iTunes, and Facebook. Or check out Redacted Media on Facebook or YouTube.